and welcome back to the Offspring Magazine podcast season three. It's Bea and I will be hosting today's podcast. Today we will be talking to Professor Marcus Antonietti, who is a director at the Max Planck Institute of Colloids and Interfaces. His research focuses on sustainable chemistry. And recently, he set up a kitchen lab, which comes from the idea that cooking and chemistry come together. He asked, why don't we do chemistry using the kitchen utensils, machines, and processes, which can also be useful for synthetic chemists. So rather than being a lab where edible food is made, he uses kitchen apparatus to make non-edible products. Professor Antonietti has a wide variety of interesting projects taking place in the kitchen lab, such as projects on circular economy of wood, the extraction of resveratrol in the kitchen environment as a replacement for BPA, encapsulation processes of perfumes and oils for cosmetics, and many more. So stay tuned if you want to find out about these projects and exactly how the kitchen lab works. I hope you will enjoy this podcast. Hi, Marcus. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Why don't we just start by having you introduce yourself and telling us what you do? Yeah, I'm Marcus Antonietti. I'm at the Max Planck Institute of Colleges and Interfaces. I do my current job as a director now for 29 years. So I'm a rather experienced director. (laughs) And of course, as that, I'm facing in five years my retirement. And this is why I'm allowed now to be creative and free as practically none of my younger colleagues because I can do the things I want to do. And Kitchen Lab, of course, is one of these ideas which I started and which now really turns to a big success story even. Great. So um, let's go back and why don't you just tell us like what you do, but also you can mention the other research groups that you have as ah, well. Okay, if you like, no problem. So I'm director of the, of the Department for College Chemistry and I'm working on sustainable chemistry now for the last 25 years. I'm trained as a polymer chemist, but meanwhile, I mostly do carbon negative products, uh, catalysis for the energy environmental change. Yeah, I have about 1000 papers and around 60 of my people are now professor. Oh, wow. Okay. And so then talk a bit about the kitchen lab. So what, what is the kitchen lab? <laughs> The kitchen lab comes from the idea that I like cooking, of course, and I'm a chemist and uh, at home, practically, yeah, my wife and my daughters prefer that I cook because obviously chemists are experienced. And then I talked to other peers and we found out that cooking and chemistry comes in, in, in many cases indeed together. So many chemists are trained and excellent creative chefs. So I was looking for the reasons. And then, of course, you know, molecular cuisine, rotational vaporizer, vacuum freeze drying. This has found entry in Michelin star cuisine. But I was interested in the inversion. Why we do not use a standard kitchen and do chemistry in a standard kitchen? Or are cooking processes also beneficial uh, for chemistry, for synthetic chemistry? Uh, And... At the beginning, it was meant for shoot kids because whenever they touch a chemical, of course, you have to have an allowance. And if they would take supermarket products and uh, even pharmacy products or headache pills are allowed, uh, can they do explore the beauty of chemistry with that? And it started like that. But the kitchen lab was then quickly taken over by my graduate students because they found an appeal in kitchen uh, tools to scale up the recipes we are doing. And meanwhile, I would say it's one of the most heavily used laboratories because you can make chemistry in short time by cooking process and avoid some of the problems you have in an ordinary lab. Okay, interesting. So what kind of recipes do you make in the kitchen lab? So typically what you know is baking. Yeah, so there's a pizza oven. A pizza oven is a remarkably controlled piece so can go to 550 degrees centigrade and for people doing solid state condensations and materials, this is a standard temperature. 
be aware that the Airbus 380 is baked in an autoclave, but we use a pizza oven for that. So we do carbonization chemistry. The product, however, is not edible. It's not dangerous, but not edible. So we bake ceramic plates, shields, yeah, uh, wood replacement, foams, insulation foams. And I think insulation foam is a thing easy to explain. We have polystyrene foam. This is special waste in Germany. So it costs you about 100 times more to get rid of it than to buy it. Yeah, because it's full of brominated compounds. And what we did is we made a type of souffle, uh, a porous structure baked in the oven, which can replace polystyrene. And it works very nicely. Okay, so basically, the way I understand it is that like you're reversing the kitchen. So you're using the kitchen uh, techniques, but you're not actually making food. You're making other non-edible useful material. Yes, I think it's important. It's, it's still a Max Planck operation. And of course, we are paid by the taxpayer. And new food is not a part of our institute profile. Yeah, this is very clear. But think about you make a kilogram of noodles. Yeah, and a noodle is in the very end, then a hollow structure which looks like your rashi rings in chemistry, which means it's indeed an active catalyst structure in principle. So we can make catalytic active noodles by a pasta machine and we have a one kilogram amount immediately. This one kilogram amount is needed to talk to the engineers. However, I have to be honest, I cannot control what my people do in their free time. And I already know that the number of things without being paid by the Max Planck Society, of course, have made it into the vegan kitchen, for instance vegan whipping cream. So all these are colloidal processes. Of course, yeah, if you want to explore something new, and again, this is done too. And as the kitchen lab, of course, it's a space free of toxic compounds and no instrument was ever used for a chemical, real chemical purpose. This is possible and allowed. Yeah. So yes, people do food recipes. There are brilliant things you can do, yeah, like new type spinach cakes and so on, where you, re you really teach the rules of college chemistry and apply them even a cooking recipe. But officially this is done uh, after work by using the infrastructure for your own, solve your own problems. Yeah. So what kind of other in infrastructure or um, yeah, uh, apparatus do you have in your kitchen lab? Apart from the pizza oven, of course. We have everything which is a kitchen. So we would try to make it really, we have a kneader, for instance, we have an extruder, it's called. So everything you know as a kitchen machine is used for a recipe. Yeah, so, and even you can program these things. And then you immediately see the advantage, yeah, because a kneader, where you can knead a dirk into it, yeah, and you can buy a professional one for a thousand euro, a, a corresponding needle would cost 10,000 euro if it's allowed for chemicals. So this is the economy of scale. Yeah. And indeed, kneading in material science is a standard operation. Yeah? Making dirks, extruding. This is more on the chemical engineering side, of course, but all these things are to be done. And the crazy thing is all that is much cheaper if you take, take kitchen tools. Okay, so so the kitchen tools are actually a lot cheaper than the 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 apparatus that we have in the lab, and so that's oh, one of the course. main. Yes, yeah, so that's there one of the main. Twenty main million things. people who have a kitchen, and then yeah. maybe one thousand people who have a lab. So this is called economy of scale, yeah. 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 The quality, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if everyone has a kneader at home, but uh, this is, I would say, more the obsession of elder rich colleagues, where the kids are grown up, and where you start to look for fanciness you can place in your kitchen. If you ever have watched a German uh, cooking show, you see that all of them have these tools. Yeah, uh, Some of them are even uh, are cooking robots. Yeah, And I can only tell you, robotized synthesis has arrived in the kitchen, but it has not arrived in the chemistry lab. So you see how much chemistry can learn indeed from, from kitchen work. Yeah, I guess you're limited with scale though. Um, you can't really scale up so much, or is that possible? So I think you are an organic chemist, yeah? I am an organic chemist, yeah. Good. So when you do a lot, it's a gram. Yeah, usually yeah. most of your stuff is done in a milligram. And there's a word outside called application, of course. If you come with 100 milligram to them, yeah, they look as desperate as they always look because the smallest amount they can use to see if the scale-up works is maybe 100 gram, maybe a kilogram. We don't talk about the 15 tons you need for in, indeed an industrial product production. But don't forget it's kitchen lab. 
And if you make a cake, a kilogram is nothing for you. And this mismatch of scales in your chemistry work and in your cooking work, yeah, this is something we can bridge a bridge for no price. So if I'm doing heterogeneous catalyst, for instance, the kilogram scale is a scale where you start to talk with industry colleagues without any problems. I would say the chemistry would be much for far progressed if all your beautiful things you do in a lab would really arrive in technology, but we have this scale gap. And the kitchen lab is one of the tools to close the scale lab. And this is maybe scientifically oversold, but this is what it is at the moment. Okay, interesting. So tell me about some of the projects that you have going, because I'm really interested to know what, what kind of projects you actually do. Okay, the most important thing which will make me turn scale is uh, a circular economy of wood. You know, of course, that we have concrete building and wood houses, and concrete is very non-sustainable concerning CO2 footprint. So in the very end, you want to have a circular pro product. And many people try to reinvent wood building because wood building, of course, wood is regrowing. Yeah. And we want to go one step further. So in Berlin, they built the first wooden skyscraper. But if you type in wooden skyscraper in Google, you see maybe 100 projects all over the world because we cannot even pay it, uh, for the houses. We have to pay according to current price standards. So if CO2 prices would at building, no one could afford an apartment anymore. Uh, so we go back to wood and this wood is in our case is circular so what we do in the very end we take wood even not the most beautiful pieces you use for construction but even waste products and we disintegrate as chemists the wood into three products it's cellulose hemicellulose and lignin yeah and this is in the very end also done in a of course cellulose mill or paper mill but uh, we use also the two other compounds then in a dug like feature which means we make a wood cake we remix the cellulose and the lignin and the hemicellulose and we melt extrude it to a new piece and you can imagine for instance an ikea shelf but this ikea shelf because it's not grown but optimized chemistry is eight times as stable as the ordinary ikea shelf you cannot bend it you cannot break it yeah, I always have little pieces to show around. And all that is done in the kitchen because the remixing is done in a kneader. The extrusion is done in an extruder. And we, of course, press it to some type of lasagne. Yeah. And this lasagne is then recondensed to the wood. And we believe indeed that we can use this for furniture. Yeah. I'm a material chemist. Everything with me is automatically scale and automatically a product. Yeah. And uh, think about indeed if you would go to IKEA and the load you put in your car would be eight times less. Yeah, this is a big thing because the size of IKEA pieces is only limited by the ability to carry it into your apartment. So IKEA would even sell much more. Yeah, because everyone is shopping as much as she or he can carry. Yeah, and of course also the liberty of construction. The fact that everything is straight is, of course, coming is coming from sawmills. Yeah, if we extrude the stuff, I can make any wood construction with, with any curvature, because then it looks like, well, in the very end, a melt extruded piece of plastic, but it is wood. Yeah, and this is exactly the idea. So indeed, I think here the rigatoni is a perfect case. A rigatoni is not just a hollow tube. Yeah. And if you have then such a hollow tube, yeah, you can make tomato sticks out of it and construction pieces. Yeah, but it's essentially just a rigatoni you put into your garden. Okay, so so that's one of the projects where you just you remake wood into a better form. Yeah, the other thing is indeed, and this is maybe closer to food, that we are going to the secret recipes, health benefits of tea, yeah, or red wine, of course, in my case. And one of the compounds you can easily extract also in a kitchen environment is a molecule called resveratrol. Resveratrol is a still bean with three hydroxy groups. Yeah. And it has the perfect chance to be the future replacement for bisphenol A. Bisphenol A is, uh, I don't know if you know bisphenol A, but it's sad to say in all epoxy resins, it's in all polycarbonates and then it's an endocrine disruptor. So bisphenol A maybe kills the family wishes of 40,000 young men in Germany, yeah, because it really makes men infertile. 
Yeah, and so it its replacement is an eager name. We really tried to make a food construction uh, to resveratrol and from resveratrol, there's here, there's a gap where we have to go to the lab. We do an epoxidation indeed. Uh, resveratrol based epoxy resins are not endocrine disruptive, are biodegradable and have the potential to replace bisphenol A in a number of places. Where is now the kitchen dimension? Of course, you don't want to win resveratrol from wine. You do it in the very end from an uh, immigrant plant. This is uh, the Japanese, uh, a, a Japanese grass. I only know the German name. And this Japanese grass contains 15% of uh, Japanese switchgrass is the name. 15% of the root is resveratrol. So what you do in the very end, you make mashed potatoes and you extract the resveratrol in the kitchen towards a resveratrol rich fraction, which of course are standard operations of chemistry, but also standard operations of cooking. I like this project very much because it's a real molecule created. It's created from an immigrant plant and the step really, the key step is to win it from the, the roots of an invasive plant. Yeah, and this is a kitchen operation. But then I'm interested in the extraction. So how do you actually extract resveratrol in the kitchen? Like what, what kind of technique do you use there? Oh, it's called in the very end fermentation. So you need indeed, you have to start with a stage of microbiology. First, you do a really, you put it in a moulinette. So you have to shred it. Yeah. Then you have these meshed, these meshed roots. Yeah. And then indeed, because resveratrol is glucosylated, you have to ferment it. And we ferment it indeed with some type like a, hefe type, so like a yeast dog, yeah. And after that, you really go extraction. And the good thing with resveratrol is you can dissolve it in ethanol, yeah. So we do an ethanolic extraction, which you know is a part of some cooking recipes. It's like a liqueur you create, yeah. And like that, it's really everything is still allowed, yeah. Here we have to tell the fork you know, not to drink the ethanol, but that's okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, and, and so there's advantages of extracting resveratrol in the kitchen lab versus extracting it in a chemical lab. No, never indeed. This is always the, 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 the lab as we use it, of course, is optimized for cleanness. Productivity is different. That's the point. You're, so if you extract resveratrol in a sock select extractor, the whole construction is that you can make maybe take a hundred gram of roots and you end up with maybe 10 grams of resveratrol. You can do it. Yes, there's no problem. The problem is I can do it on this kilogram scale immediately. It's cheaper and it's more comfy and it's closer to the later production process, I would say. So I don't believe that indeed most of the industrial chemistry operations are clean tech. Yeah. Some of them are rather dirty. Yeah. If you have observed the number of, of production sites, they, they look clean, but they are not really clean because the product has to be cheap and affordable and it has to be run, of course, in an effective manner. Yeah, that's a really cool project. I really like that. But it's uh, very also, I feel like it's just different to the wood. I feel like it's two completely different projects, actually. Um. So, yeah, what, what other projects do you have? Well, now we are already in cosmetics. So a big part of coloring science is indeed emulsion stabilization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And here there is a new rising star. Um, how to how to enter this project? Many of the modern consumer products contain polymers. Yeah. So for instance, if you have a fabric softeners, yeah, you see the pro the commercials. Ah, my laundry is smelling after seven days, still like it was freshly cleaned, and this already tells you that the perfume is encapsulated. Mm. Yeah. And indeed, a major load you find in drinking water, then in fishes of microplastic is coming from the washing process and the laundry process. So encapsulation has to be replaced by something biological and biodegradable. And this is, again, exactly where the food lab can set in. Because, of course, instead of encapsulating a perfume, we are encapsulating an oil. It could be olive oil. Yeah, or sunflower oil. It has to have the right polarity. There's a number of oils available. And this is the model pure form. The water is water. And then the encapsulation process, this is something you have to solve with the kitchen process. So it's essentially uh, 
whipping cream, making whipping cream, yeah, making a mayonnaise by using mechanical stirrers, but applying the right stabilizer. And now you will tell me a good stabilizer is egg yolk, for instance. It contains lecithin. So making yeah. mayonnaise. Yeah, yeah, that's actually true. So the yeah. first food idea would be indeed uh, take the perfume, take the water, take egg yolk, and try to make an encapsulated, yeah, encapsulated perfume. The encapsulation in egg yolk is then lecithin and, of course, the protein sitting on the surface between oil and water. And this is called a suspension stabilizer. Yeah, this is classic. Yeah. Then you go to the people and say, no, 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 we don't really want to have food in our cleaning products. Yeah. We also want to have be the product vegan, so egg is not possible. And the structure we take at the moment is nanocellulose. Nanocellulose is cellulose but it's an object as big as a protein and it's super highly surface active so if i teach a chemist what nanocellulose how amphiphilic it is it's really like a cyclodextrin it has mm -hmm. a polar and unpolar side and because of that recipes with nanocellulose are incredibly stable whereas the product is considered biological and inert yeah bad news also you and me cannot digest cellulose yeah but others can Microbia can, yeah, and this is why the stuff, of course, will degrade. Yeah. So indeed, going practically in a big, big, big market as a cosmetic and cleaning or laundry agent market is incredibly big. Yeah, and replacing their current uh, chemical solutions by biological solutions, avoiding food, is a food lab problem. Okay. Okay. So... In that kind of project, you're just, you make the stuff different. So the encapsulation technique here is just different. You make it biologically as opposed to chemically. We take a recipe, which is a chemical recipe. We turn yeah. it first into a food recipe or food-like recipe. And then, of course, in addition, we are using optimized instruments. Yeah, because uh, you don't need an ultra thorax. Indeed, there's so many emulsion preparation in the lab yeah. for, for mayonnaise and so on. And these stirrers, if you look very carefully of a typical stirrer box you get provided with professional kitchenware, is much more than you have in a lab. Yeah. yeah. So the, 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 the typical stirrer is the ooh stirrer you get supported. But be aware that a, a broom for a whipping cream is much more optimized for the problem than anything you can have in a lab, which is one for all. Yeah, yeah. Wow. But so, you know, the first project you talked about was furniture and now we're all the way to cosmeceuticals, basically. So it's just such a huge range of different projects that you have going. How many people do you have in the lab? Okay. So colloid chemistry is a, is a transversal discipline. So we don't work with inorganic or organic or biologic chemistry. Our, our science is about the small length scale so everything which we what we do is between one and hundred nanometer and it's about interfaces yeah so be aware that food and furniture is not really different yeah? except of course at the final product but all the building blocks are the same yeah so for us it's a rather cohesive body of projects i was describing to you because we need the same set of instruments we work on the same type of problems it's just that your way of aligning things by starting letters for instance is one way to align things yeah and if you ask me wow there's so many names with an a how you can handle them then i tell you yeah it's the way how you the sort science yeah we we think it's all the same and indeed my people i have around 70 people it's a typical Max Planck group size, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And, but not uh, everyone works in the kitchen lab, I'm assuming. About, meanwhile, the kitchen lab is like NMR lab, uh, a facility. It's not that you really do a PhD in your kitchen lab, but as all the people are going through NMR one or later in a project, all people go to a scale-up problem or formulation problem, and you can book the kitchen, kitchen lab as you book FDIR or NMR. If I call it kitchen lab, it's really a facility. It's the kitchen facility. Yeah? I don't have even, a, if you look carefully on the internet, a group leader on that because it's not the way to align it. Yeah? But everyone is going there and it's so much fun. Yeah? The social dimension is, of course, we make pizza there too. Yeah? There are pizza battles and everything uh, after work hours.
hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I, so it's like, you know, everyone just works in your lab on normal projects, but then sometimes you might have to go to the kitchen lab to make something. That's the way gotcha. how it is organized, exactly. No one should have only fun, yeah, but sometimes to have fun, even if you have a hard synthetic project, is not bad at all. It's about energy balance and making us happy as chemists. Yeah. Okay, well then, because actually also what I was curious about was where you publish papers related to the kitchen lab, whether it's still in like peer reviewed journals that only scientists can access, basically, or whether you publish uh, texts that are also accessible for the general public and understandable to the general public. Oh, now you put your finger in the right place. Yeah, we publish in peer reviewed journals, of course. So it's still, and if we call something, you can type in notations like pasta catalysis and you will find papers where we publish that. I once had the plan to also pick up much more people from social space via social media. But the point is, I need a young person to do so because I'm so distant to these modern times as it could be, that it always stays a nice plan. But so I, 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 I should have to hire, I, I would have to hire a person really being good in social media and it would be a revolution. I can tell you because people, it's interactive, of course. So I think there would be a lot of requests coming from the outside world because really it gives chemistry a positive face. So if we have young people, they always go into the kitchen lab. Yeah, because this is what they can tell others about how they do their chemistry. Yeah, but I, I fear my, my own time account is not big enough yeah, to also fear such a massive social media operation, which presumably would rely on a full person full time. Yeah. Yeah. I was just curious because obviously because you only use like kitchen apparatus, I think that the way you explain the science can actually be done e in an easier way than if you explain the science going on in like an actual lab, because then you have to be explaining techniques that people don't even understand. So it's actually, it's like a great way to engage the general public in science as well. But have you thought about like, I don't know, writing a book on what you do? <laughs> we are we are back back to the problem of being a Max Planck director. I think you know it from your own boss. So my my week already has about sixty hours. I have social interests. I have a wife. Yeah. The the point is these are the things, and I, I start the conversation like that. You dream of once you are a retired person. Yeah. Because as indeed the Kohle Forschung, we are a very social institute. So elder people, of course, have to give back their resources because they're younger generation waiting. But I, I, I fear I will be not kicked out for the next 10 years yeah, as long as I'm productive and do something meaningful. And this is, of course, what I'm hoping for. I have big dreams of writing a book about the history of chemistry. And of course, kitchen chemistry book, I think it would be opened even open access into it's not about making money or having a printed piece it's really to reach people and this these are the things with my occupation you dream of once you're retired because then you can fill your years without too serious work yeah and doing something meaningful with chemistry without being in the way of young people yeah yeah no that makes that makes a lot of sense um so going back to the projects because i'm just really interested in all the projects that you have going and i think you have even more than what you've just yeah hundreds, that you've hundreds, hundreds. Yeah, so i honestly really... i'm really interested in knowing all of them that you do i saw on your website you also mentioned there was something about like pea protein extraction yes so maybe this we can talk about that one but here we are now we're already very close to food and this makes it more maybe less maybe more interesting so pea protein is the big hope so if you go th throughout our nutrition habits i think we agree that all of us should lead less meat yeah being really vegan is difficult as you might know yeah because there's so many things we only find into in other food than vegetables that it's difficult to have a healthy nutrition but this is something where chemistry can indeed help a lot and pea protein we meanwhile is it's a common place they are vegan burgers from pea protein so pea protein pea is one of the vegetables which has the highest protein content so pea you can in principle cover your complete protein need from pea and this is of course is wonderful yeah uh, however the current way to produce it 
creates a protein which is extremely bitter and which has absolutely no relation to food. So what's the current way to produce it? The, the current way is standard protein separation in biotechnical means. The final product, and you can buy it in indeed lifestyle shops, is a bag of pea protein. And this is indeed the point where also we start. We leave all the industrial extraction of pea to those guys who already do it. It's a new protein, of course. But then you have a rock solid powder, which when you put it in the mouth, gives a sense of dryness and bitterness. Yeah. So it's nothing you would really enjoy to eat. Yeah. And now, now the whole production process from pea protein to the hamburger is full of chemical sensations. And indeed, it's one of the biggest market and we get a lot of side money for projects from that. So I have to be a little careful what we produce. So be aware that, for instance, the big problem of such a vegan burger is that it contains no iron. And it would be the chance uh, to have iron also into vegan and vegetarian food. Yeah. So what people do, now I'm careful, yeah, is really they take, for instance, iron lactate. And it gives you exactly the sensation you need because you melt the crystal throughout grilling. Yeah. The, the vegan beef turns rosé instead of uh, greenish gray. Yeah, greenish gray is an awful color because the Augen essen mit in German. Yes, so uh, you want to have the right sensation, the right taste, the right haptics. Yeah, and you do indeed by adding exactly this, uh, so to say, iron bleeding iron three compound. Yeah, which is good, of course, then for your iron nutrition. But the other side gives the sensation of beef, which ends up in a slight rosé tone throughout baking. The second thing is, if you chew a hamburger, there's texture. Texture means uh, it's not a homogeneous material. This would taste in as Götterspeise or indeed a piece of fruit. No, it's a fibrous material. So what we have to introduce is the right viscosity and rheology of pea protein. And you do indeed either by adding plantal fibers, because these are the fibers which make the biting resistance, considering a steak as perfect. So be aware that one part of the eating sensation is the mechanical analysis by a tooth. Yeah. So if you don't have the right resistance, you will not like it. Yeah. And so on and so on. And this is, of course, is done by extruding to the pea protein, to little spaghettis. Yeah. These are then, of course, cooked. And then you get something which looks like a meat fiber which is a protein fiber, but you have to make the powder to fiber. Yeah. Then the worst indeed is that you have to be able to bake it. Yeah. Because usually if you formulate now your pea protein in chemistry, heating up reduces viscosity. Yeah. So be aware that if you heat up a burger, you still can touch with your hands to 100 degrees, create soup. Yeah. So it melts so to say. This is a sensation you don't want to have. So you have to control, indeed, the rheology. This is, for instance, done by something which precipitates at higher temperature. Yeah. And if you look very carefully, the current solution is a carboxymethylcellulose for this operation. So you have 10% weight percent of tapestry lime in current vegan burgers. Yeah. Just because of this ability that the rheology at elevated temperatures has to be correct. To replace that by a food operation is a job for a college chemistry who is able to cook. Yeah. Because no one wants to have tapestry lime in a vegan burger. It's vegan in a strict sense, of course, but it's still tapestry lime. And these are the typical jobs we are doing. But here I stay a little away because solutions, other guys pay science because uh, they want to have a market, yeah, and this is complex also in law questions. But this is the challenge. I can describe the challenge to make really a vegan burger, to go through all the steps that you cannot distinguish it from a meat burger. And this is what the people in the very end want, yeah, uh, is a lot of science work, rheology, chemistry work, yeah. Only a person with a sense for cooking can solve. And so that those are also kind of projects that are taking place. There are many like that, indeed. So indeed, it turns slowly back to food. So there is a food line in that. 
But again, as an institute, we always have to take care that it's about interfaces and, uh, you know, and color, it's our texture, dispersion, two-phase systems, uh, because otherwise we should not do it. Yeah. Do you also have any projects like in the field of pharmaceuticals? This is a sensitive issue because here we come to a legal taboo. Yeah. So in the very end, as an organic chemist, you always dream of making an active pharmaceutical, but the hurdle to bring it to the people is very high. Yeah. So we have the Food and Drug Administration, Drug, drug Administration. So I tell you there are at least three clinical trials and really bringing the super active compound to the market is 150 million euro at the moment. And uh, of course, many years to wait, eight years, 10 years. Yeah. And this is something we try to avoid. And you already said this, there's something like cosmeceuticals, nutri, nutriceuticals. And this is the niche of the whole operation because everything which was already traditionally applied, yeah, you're allowed to continue to apply. So if you know that, for instance, peppermint tea is good for your health, there will be no three straight uh, food and drug operation here because it's traditional knowledge. Yeah. Any cosmetics which would work anti-aging grip would be forbidden because it's then a pharmaceutical. Only when this anti-aging cream has either, either no activity or the activity is made on natural compounds, then you're allowed to use it without the longish process. And this is where indeed we and the kitchen lab are. We do pharmaceuticals, but we call them cosmeceuticals or nutrinomics, of course, because we try to understand traditional knowledge, how the stuff acts, yeah, and then really bring it into recipe by, for instance, creating indeed a cream also for young persons, yeah, um, which simply, so to say, blocks the UV atta radiation and keeps the skin in the very end wet because already it was done like that maybe a thousand years ago. Yeah. And this is something where we are heavily active. So identifying these uh, molecules is a clearly uh, pharmaceutical operation. Yeah. And you take, for instance, the TCM, traditional Chinese medicine recipe, and you know that malaria agents are coming from bifus, from Artemisia something. Yeah? And this was first described in a recipe by a medical doctor of the Chinese emperor. And then the lady, the Chinese lady, got the Nobel Prize for identifying it as a molecule and bringing it into modern malaria cure. And there's a number of these things. There are super strong anti-cancer agent in uh, the Taiwanese comfort tree and making a cooking recipe indeed with comfort tree and trying first to follow the molecules, but develop, for instance, a tea recipe, which maybe as a TCM medicine could support healing processes. This is a big thing. So yes, we are playing with a number of things. The story I can tell is the one for Römer. There is something called Brennessel Erde. So what's Brennessel English? You can help me. Oh, that's a good question. Okay. So uh, I don't know. It's either. an itch, itching. Exactly. The, <laughs> itching the wild thing. Sting. Uh, uh, but there is a recipe coming indeed from medieval uh, times where you take this itching plant, you put it in a, into a linen bag and you put it below earth for one year. And the reason there is, of course, fermentation by the soil. So everything which is, so to say, plant is degraded. And what is left, we already know, is the phenol fraction. And phenols, of course, are very active compounds. Many hormones are phenols, of course, because phenols rather strongly bind already at nanomole concentration to specific and unspecific targets. So the trick is indeed to make a Brennnessel recipe or an itching plant recipe, which we then really try to transfer into a Rheuma Salve, so rheumatic yeah, care, yeah, which is just based on natural, and it's about phenol extraction, this in isolation of phenols, very similar to the resveratrol. And, and if you then go back indeed to the legal limits, yeah, then you see indeed all these phenols have a daily allowance of 15 gram per day. So you can eat up to 15 gram of resveratrol a day because the 15 grams come, this is the legal limit for any chemical, even 
salt. Yeah. Uh, so it means it's essentially inert, but has a positive action, which is an antioxidation. In case of the rheumatics, rheuma is an infection. Yeah. It's indeed it's the bactericide action of phenols, which is well known from wood plates. So if you cut cheese or wood, you do it on wooden plates uh, on in the kitchen. kitchen. Cheese or meat in the kitchen, you do it in wooden plates because the wooden plate is auto disinfecting. So on a wooden plate, indeed, bacteria do not grow, contrary to glass and metal plates. And this is why we still cut uh, meat on wooden plates because it's a sterile solution. Yeah. And this is, of course, is a concept, again, you can transfer to many parts because antibacterial surfaces, antibacterial creams, obviously have an importance. And it's not always organic chemistry which will solve the problem, especially in the kitchen space where you don't want to eat the strong uh, disinfectants. You rather prefer mild disinfectants based on a plant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, like you mentioned that what's interesting is that you, you find out what compounds are important and then you find ways how to either extract them or use them then. So do you have people that do the research also beforehand to know what what projects we should actually Good, good do? question. Uh, a Max Planck Institute usually is highly organized. So we have, we are at our institute, we are about 430 people. And of course, this cannot be done in an single department so we have one department which really goes to bone and wood which is mechanical engineering and we have a other department which is organic chemistry which is peter seberger and peter seberger is one of the leading german guys in medical chemistry so and of course for his even standard organic in-house projects he has all the analytical skills multi-dimensional uh, nmr for natural compounds, but also all these HPLC, MS, GCMS, derivatization GCMS tools you need for exactly these molecules. So we can take profit simply from, from the existence of an infrastructure of the Max Planck Society. We ourselves are not very well-trained organic chemists or analytical chemists, but we have these guys directly side by side. And this, of course, is the special fun in the Max Planck Institute that is, is really usually rather broad and you can touch by a single conversation a whole range of disciplines. Yeah, yeah. So it's not a food lab in a shul, it's not a food lab in a Michelin star restaurant, it's a food lab in a Max Planck Institute. Yeah, and it's not even just a food lab, it's just, yeah, just using kitchen techniques, but in the end you don't just do food, you barely do yes. any food. <laughs> But if you would restrict yourself by a box, I think this is not how science should be nowadays. Food and not food is edibility, but food yeah. and non-food can look very similar, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah? Only that it has no nutrinomical value, of course. So there is no calories you can assign to it. But even that, I fear to say, is turning into food because 80% of the stuff you can buy for, well, Obese people, of course, all these additives for nutrition, filling your stomach. This is not food. Yeah. This is chemistry. Yeah, exactly. So actually, when I first just came across the kitchen lab, I thought maybe it was more going to be research on like additives, because that is just food chemistry. But it's not. <laughs> you it's do not. And again, to choosing the way of, for instance, lecithin, you know that the biggest market nowadays outside of pharmacy is lecithin because lecithin allowed the formulation of the mRNA yeah, uh, to, yeah. to deliver it. So be aware that the whole mRNA project we had throughout Corona was essentially driven by food chemistry. Yeah. yeah. Because we can make liposomal formulations yeah, as we did in the past, of course. Yeah. And lecithin is either in soybeans of course mostly in soybeans and in egg yolk yeah but it's the traditional solution of nature for delivery problems so i fear to say that even not naming that food chemistry or food lab chemistry it has arrived to the deepest problem and it is already practically a skill as a formulation person you have to have yeah and as there's no drug at the moment without formulation yeah, 
I fear making molecules and bringing them to the right target in the near future will have exactly the same value. Yeah. Um, I just, you mentioned lectin. So like, do you have any projects that deal specifically with maybe lectin extraction or the use of lectin? Now here I have to say no. Indeed, the whole range is so broad that we try to fix ourselves to the sim simple things and simple things indeed. Again, I would ca call myself rather a polyphenol guy than a protein guy yeah, because proteins, many, many people are there and uh, uh, it's, it's a known and rich chemistry. You have to make decisions. So I take yeah. the stuff other people don't want to do. Yeah. <laughs> and phenols are nasty. That's just the point. Yeah. yeah. I mean, now in college and interface science, they stick on everything. Yeah. So they oxidize very rapidly because they're antioxidants. Yeah. But come on, I can turn around to interview and say, now that you have talked to me for 45 minutes, yeah, I give you <laughs> one of the biggest problems of society and you tell me how to solve it. Oh, yeah? okay. It's indeed the idea of methylparaben. Yeah, you know, methylparaben is one of these molecules, which is in practically everything you use. Yeah, and it's a no-go anymore. Methylparaben is a phenol and the other side is, so it's a 4-hydroxybenzoic acid methyl ester. This is the methylparaben, and there are different chain lengths in the ester group. Methylparaben is indeed endocrine disruptive again. Yeah, but you need it because otherwise you could not sell a cosmetic cream. Yeah, so you add it as an antioxidant when using phenol oxidation as a sacrificial oxygen sink to keep the cream, cream clean. And the product, of course, formed then is a quinone at the end, so it's not very dangerous. How you would replace indeed methylparaben in all pharmaceutical recipes? Well, yeah. that's a great question, but I I well, would. The answer is to give me a phenol with similar uh, reduction power, which is natural, of course, and which is in all food. Yeah. And for instance, I can tell you, vanillin is such a molecule. Yeah. So vanillin is a perfect replacement. Resveratrol is such a compound. Yeah. So all these structures are proven part of food. Yeah. And again, I hope you're not going too much to Starbucks, but vanillin is a part of Starbucks pro products. If you take a vanilla flavored yeah, coffee, yeah, you have qu quite a lot of that inside. Yeah? And it means it's allowed, it's food allowed. Yeah. So indeed, this type of thinking, it's more thinking, it's software, yeah, will allow you indeed rather rapidly to get rid of all the nasty stuff and the things we use today and replace it, because we're chemists, of course, by stuff uh, taken from nature and known to be uh, inert. I really like that. I really like just like the, the approach of finding what molecules you should replace. So identifying them first and then in the kitchen lab with simple techniques, knowing how to get these replacement chemicals. And then I guess you might have to go into the actual chemistry lab to find ways to introduce the new uh, chemical entities. Of course, I, I don't pretend that indeed kitchen lab can replace anything. It will neither replace organic chemistry in the lab nor industrial chemistry, which has to be done in, of course, noble steel reactors, which are closed and are rather optimized. I told you it's a new tool and it's a tool really bridging the worlds of molecules and the world of industrial production. So it, it really meets a niche, innovation niche, where people can even think practical. Yeah? So I'm, I'm quite sure that you're coming from one of the groups where the other side is taught. But believe me, many young synthetic persons, chemists, yeah, don't have a real clue how application works. Because it's indeed a distant continent, yeah, which you hardly even have seen. Yeah? And uh, to have this as a part of your education, to think already in terms of application is, I think, nothing bad even for the most academic synthetic person. Yeah. And this is where the kitchen lab is. Yeah. So um, where do you see the kitchen lab in the next 10, 20 years? I, I see it as an invasive franchising structure, to be very brutal. Yeah. We will not make money with it, but this, this, you have to show it once that it works. You have to set up rules. There are rules, there are safety rules. Uh, we are also living in an administrative world, so we have to really guarantee what is done and what is not done. But once you have this content, this software content, you can can start to share. So indeed, one of my projects is to go 
viral, yeah. Well, virality is defined by others, but at least to offer the virus, yeah, uh, that people can really just look at it, make a more detailed description. But obviously, this will have to wait for my retirement because until then, Max Planck Society is controlling my daily life by, well, also very many pleasurable administrative duties, yeah. And from the day where, where I'm free again, yeah, then I can do these things. But I would say it will go viral. It's simply such a pleasant concept that as, as long as you're doing, well, uh, indeed, consumer product related issues, material issues, even pharmaceutical chemistry, yeah, you can formulate your own drug in a way that it's really useful. Because as you know, yeah, the drug is just one component of the tablet. There's so many others yeah, which you don't know about that you can start to understand and explore that too. Yeah. And I guess the way that the kitchen lab grows is just it grows with what gets developed on the market for kids. Yes. I can tell you that we already have the first industrial mirror construction and I'm very proud of that. Yeah. So one of the leading uh, fragrance and flavor producers, uh, Firme Nicht, this yeah, is a genetic based company. Yeah. They are already having a food toolbox. Huh. Yeah. And, and it came by infection. Yeah, this is a, a virus, a viral infection from this in situ. Wow. And why is it so beneficial for them to have it? For all the reasons we were talking about, yeah, because indeed you can do scale ups, yeah, you can do naturals. And of course, uh, if, if you think about fragrance and flavors, you don't want to have hardcore polychlorophenol chemistry in a fragrance. Yeah, there. that's yeah. actually true. Yeah. Uh, automatically, you end up with things, yeah, which in principle you can even digest. Yeah. You will be pleased about the perfume which penetrates your skin and not kills your liver. Yeah. Yeah. And this was not the case for a long time, you have to know. So the famous nitrobenzene uh, in uh, deodorant problem, yeah, we had 10 years ago was a classical mistake where people misunderstood, yeah, indeed, where all this stuff will end up, namely in, the, in your liver. Yeah. You take a perfume, half of it you smell, half of it penetrates your skin to simplify it, and 60% ends up in the liver. Yeah. yeah. There, of course, it has to be degraded. Wow. That's, that was actually really fascinating, knowing that Fermanique is also thinking yes. about this. No, they have, this they have a food lab. And literally, they do very similar things. And as they are professionals, of course, they do doing even more than we are doing, but they're doing it very well. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, this was a really, really interesting conversation. Thank you a lot for your time. And yeah, um, I'm looking forward to see how it all progresses and if the kitchen lab goes viral. <laughs> well, me too. I'm looking forward to that too. And it was a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, hopefully this podcast will also help get the information out there about the kitchen. It lab. will, it will, believe me. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. That's it. Thank you all so much for listening. If you would like to learn more about Professor Antonietti's work, please visit the Max Planck Institute of Colloids and Interfaces website. And if you like our podcast, make sure to follow us on our Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram page. This is the best way to stay up to date when a new podcast will be released. Thanks again for listening. Bye. Austrian Magazine the podcast is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net Science Communication Group known as the Austrian Magazine. The intro outro music is composed by Serena Brankumar and the pre-intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carrizo. If you have any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write us at offspring.podcast at phdnet.mpg.de. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye.